My name is Rose Amador LeBeau. I am President and CEO of CTC. Our mission is to help people through employment and education become self-sufficient. We have a day worker center. We have educational programs so people can get their GEDs. We serve a variety of people, people who've just become unemployed, people who have never worked. We work with homeless people. We work with people who have just gotten out of prison and have to re-enter the workforce. So we're full service. I think it's seeing people make the change, become successful, uh, make that transition, and actually having an impact on people's lives, a positive impact. To see these success stories is what it's all about. I'm Siwa Pili Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. Today we have with us Eddie Madrill. Thank Welcome, you for Eddie. Me. Thank you. And your tribal affiliation is? I am from the Pascua Yaqui people. Ah, okay. And you've been going around the world in 80 days. <laughs> now you've been going around the world in a few days, huh? How yes. many days was that? We were gone for 13 days on a 10 day tour in France. France, why did you go to France? It was an opportunity that came to us by uh, another cultural group here in the United States that has gone to France a number of times and they thought that we would be a good match for their festival. And it's in a little town called Ganat, France, which is about six hours drive south of Paris. And I took a couple of friends and we decided to go and have a good time and share the beauty of our culture to the French people. What a fun trip. So who all went on your trip? There was myself, um, Sarah Mancada, uh, Anacita Hernandez and Michael Bersier. Aha, uh -huh. and what did everyone do? Well, I thought we had a really good eclectic group of people who could dance, uh, discuss, you know, their tribal background, uh, discuss, you know, the dancing that we did. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, Michael Bersier did uh, chicken dance. He actually put on my outfit, fancy oh. dance outfit, did fancy dance. Um, he did a lot of the singing, very, very beautiful singing. Um, Anacita Hernandez brought Northern traditional dance as well as uh, fancy shawl dance and Sarah Mankata did fancy shawl dance and northern traditional dance and then I did uh, fancy dance, hoop dance and tried a little bit of singing but Michael Brewster is so much better that it was kind of embarrassing to, to sing in front of him but uh, did some singing as well and uh, we just did a lot of different performances and presentations. Wow, how exciting. So was this one of the first times they've had Native Americans at this festival? From what I understand, yes. They've had the festival for about 30 years wow. and they have people from all around the world that come in to Paris and then drive the six hours down to Gannat and do this presentation uh, you know on stage in front of 800 people in this temporary tent that they put into their little town center their town park just like you see in movies and hearing stories um, and the town Gannat is only about 2,000 people as far as population so it's really really small village um, so all these different dance groups come out and we were there and for the 10 days we're doing performances, presentations, lecture demonstrations, demonstrations wow. with kids. There's so many different things that, that took place. So do they know ahead of time which groups are coming and from which countries so they can schedule everybody in or how do oh, they do yeah, all that? Oh yeah, it's a very, like a lot of <laughs> it's a very tight schedule, very, very tight schedule. I mean, just going with one big bus to pick people up from the airport all showing up at about the same time. So when we arrived in Paris, we got onto a bus with maybe four other dance groups from around the world and wow. we were trying to get to know each other, people from Botswana and Japan, and we rode the bus down and, uh, and yeah, every single day for that 10 days, it's a, it's a tight ship. Uh, we know exactly what we're doing at 8.30 in the morning, what we're doing at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, who's giving us a ride, uh, wow. what the expectations are, are we going to do a 10 minute performance, are we doing a 45 minute performance, you know, there are so many things for them to prepare to accommodate, you know, 30 taiko drummers, high school taiko drummers from Japan, uh, 40 people dancing, you know, traditional Hungarian dance. They had to not just get the groups coming and know how to organize performances, but also they needed people to translate. 
So you had oh, people from right, huh? Serbia, from uh, you know Botswana, from uh, Kenya, all these different groups coming in. Some of them speaking English, some of them speaking a little bit of English, some of them speaking no English, like from Vietnam. They had to have interpreters there to not just interpret, but also be guides for the town and uh, expectations for the festival you know, coordinators. And who spoke French in your group, or did anyone? Well, I speak a little bit, but not enough to get us by. So we actually had a friend, it's, a, it's kind of an amazing story. Uh, my wife's mother grew up with a young lady uh, all the way th through middle school and the high school who moved out to France to be an artist. And we called her and we said, we're going to be out there. And she goes, well, I'll just call the festival committee and see if I could be your guide and interpreter. So it was actually somebody from America who was living there about, I think, two hours away from Ghana. And she came in and she just accommodated herself in a van and she just slept in her van uh, wow. for those 10 days. And uh, she was our interpreter and guide and the one who kind of uh, was our diplomatic advisor for the, the committee there and uh, the, town, the townspeople, all these different things. So that was ours. So did, was there someone that actually hosted your group? I mean, because coming from different countries, how did everyone get invited or decide to go or get included in the program? Right, so the Ghana Festival, this, uh, this festival is du monde, the, um, the festival of the world. They have, they've been doing it for 30 years. So I think they've kind of got a, a pretty good lid on how, the, how to put it together. But they're also part of a, an organization that's also accepted by UNESCO and there's different festivals all throughout France and through Europe and actually other countries as well, I believe into South America. So once you get into this and you go into the website, you learn a lot more about it, you can, I would assume you can even almost invite yourself to these different festivals and they want to know, you know, what you do, what you bring. And, uh, and so all these different groups showed up and they've been doing, some of these groups have been doing these festivals all summer long, some, the Kenya group, the Maasai people from Kenya, they had been on tour throughout Europe for like three months wow. already. And uh, so th th the festival, they just get these artists from all over the place. And you know, our group, our native group, um, was one of the very first people that they had seen. So they're really, really excited about having us out there. And as a matter of fact, there are so many uh, people from their village that was really excited, people from out of town, from far, uh, far places in France came out just to meet us. And so it was a, it was a wonderful experience to share with them. I guess you can say uh, a true nature or true representation, the best that we could do um, of native people. So we did the best that we could. Now, were you the only ones from the United States that were there? No, as there's as dancers. Or? There's one other group that had gone uh, the year prior, who were also the ones who helped tell us about the festival. Um, they do, they do traditional American dance, like square dance, um, folk dances of the Americas. Um, uh, you know, clog dancing, like Appalachian clog dancing style uh, dances. And they had been to the festival before because I know a lot of my native brothers and sisters out there, they do, they get these opportunities to go do something internationally and it doesn't quite work out. So we are very uh, skeptical about this, but the group that had told us about it, Jubilee, uh, American dance company, I think out of the East Bay, uh, they had been before. And so when they told us about it, they said they were going, so we were going. So it was kind of, it was kind of a neat experience to go with a group of people from here and one that had been there before, and we can kind of communicate with. Oh, yeah. So what did you find the most unique experience being there? Something you didn't expect to find or see or experience? Uh, wow. There's, there's a list. Um, a whole group of us, all, all groups, represented their countries in a parade during the day, and all the people came out. And then there was a night parade, so we did a parade at night. Um, they had booked these different places for us to perform. We did a presentation at this place called Volcania, which is uh, volcanoes. There's several volcanoes in this area outside of Ghana, about 45 minute drive outside of Ghana. And it's up in the mountains, and there's several volcanoes. And when you drive up, all you see is this hill, and then you park, and you walk down these stairs, and it's a, like an amusement park. They had oh, rides, and, and, and it was a tour that you go through, and it has all these images. And the reason why we were invited to go there, along with, I think, three other groups, or two other groups, is they had in the ride these people, kind of like mechanical you know, people, discussing in French about the origins of volcanoes for American Indian people, African people and Japanese people. So we got to see a representation of native people speaking French about the origins of volcanoes. Wow. Uh, they also, our very last day there, and this one's just kind of wild, they had the Jubilee Company, the American Folk Dance Company, and our company 
booked to perform in this like parking lot, mm -hmm. which we thought, okay, uh, seems a little unusual, but these, this whole trip has been kind of unusual. And uh, we danced in a parking lot and two people showed up. So that was kind of wild. Wow. One of the more interesting, interesting things that we had a chance to experience is we were invited to go to a museum exhibit that was, uh, had all this, these things from different countries that talked about and discussed and presented in traditional ways and, and antiquities, uh, feathers and the use of feathers and their uh, the interpretations of different cultures about feathers. So we went and we did a performance and we discussed feathers. And of course we had to go from English to you know French. So we had somebody interpreting all these things. So it took a while. And uh, you know, we asked a lot of the people there what they thought of American Indian people before they met us mm -hmm. and what they think now. And it was, it was beautiful that they said, now we understand the real American what Indians. What did they think before? Well, I asked the same question of all the different people from, from the people from Ireland, from Serbia, Russia, Vietnam, Japan, the Canary Islands, uh, Argentina, Botswana, you know, all these different countries uh, uh, who, is, who showed up. And I asked them all the same question. They said, well, we only know Indians from movies and books. And I said, well, which movies and which books? Very limited selection. John Wayne, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. And so when they met us and they got to see our presentations, our 10-minute presentations, our 45-minute presentations, the lecture demonstrations, they said, oh, now we understand that there's over 550 tribes. They all have different dances and languages and beliefs and stories. So we actually had an opportunity to tell stories as well. So at this museum, afterwards they said, well, we're gonna go feed you. And we said, okay. And they took us to a monastery and they took us down into the basement with the different, I guess, priests who were all sitting there eating very humbly. And we walked in and had dinner with the priests in their basement. That was unique because none of us knew what to do. We just sat there and said, okay, keep our hands on the table, eat quietly, <laughs> eat the bread if they offer us things, just say yes, and then we leave. I would say the, the yeah. The most fun we had as far as a, a foreign experience for us is we tried escargot. How was that? It was full of butter and lots of garlic, so I have no idea what the escargot tasted like, but we had lots of butter and lots of garlic. But you could say you did it. <laughs> but we could say we did it. So. Now, how did you communicate with some of the other dance groups, or did you? We did. It's several of them. I mean, it's, it seems like a, a natural thing here in the United States that in a lot of our public school systems or, you know, private schools that, you know, we have French and Spanish oftentimes being spoken um, in some neighborhoods or in some communities, you know, you have uh, Cantonese, Mandarin or Japanese, depending on, on the different neighborhoods or communities throughout, you know, urban areas and, and suburban areas in the United States that you would have another language. But almost every other country we met, they had like three languages. It was normal for them to speak English. So oftentimes we didn't have too much of a problem. There's maybe two of the companies that they had nobody that spoke English except for a couple of words. So we went through our interpreters, our interpreter to their interpreter, their interpreter to them. So we would have long conversations on a very short subject um, because they had to go through all these different translations. Did you find any of the cultures there were similar to the native culture? As a culture and how we present ourselves and what we do, not necessarily, but the essence of where people come from, what they're struggling with currently, what they're struggling with to try and retain as far as tradition, yes. Even Ireland, Russia, uh, again, the Maasai people, uh, people in Argentina, you know, Colombia, all these different people, you know, we would have these conversations. We have these downtimes where we can have these conversations. And traditional people that represent their indigeneity from their country are struggling with the same thing. There's a government process or a modernity or business that wants to overtake and say that this isn't important. And sometimes it's religious as well. So people from Ireland who are young people who want to be proud of being Irish, mm -hmm. walking out of their home with an Irish flag is very unusual for their parents to go ahead and allow that because of the trouble that they would get into. Physical trouble, not just, you know, the, the little mm -hmm. talking to. Um, but all the cultures, you know, they said this is very, very important for us to retain these things, even though modernity and, you know, politics and, and uh, so many other aspects, you know, are trying to, you know, suppress those opportunities for people to show and share and retain and celebrate their, their traditional culture. So oh, that's the thing that I thought was yeah. very, very interesting. Now, did, were there kids participating or was it mainly adults? Well, we brought only adults because it was going right. to be kind of hard for us sure. to travel <laughs> with smaller uh, children. However, some of the groups are nearby. So we say France, and to us, as soon as we say France, it's like, wow, how long was the flight? But for some of them, it was, it was a bus drive. Ah. Uh, there's between France and Spain, uh, there's a group of people called Basque, 
And if you ask them, well, which country are you in? Fran you know, France or, or Spain, they'd look at you very stern and say, we're Basque. They're trying to retain their culture and their homelands. Mm -hmm. There, the same way as a lot of our native brothers and sisters across the country are doing as well. We're not really part of this American you know, structure, poss possibly. You know, different people have different uh, perspectives mm -hmm. and ways to, to, to relay that. You know, we, this, is, this is our land, this is our home. There's, we're not from somewhere else. And a lot of these people feel the same way. So the Basque people are that, like that. Um, uh, so a lot of them were able to bring children. Uh, the Hungarian group, I think, brought a lot of young people. The Japanese group, the taiko group, it was only a high school taiko drum oh. group that came. So all of them were young people and you know, it was fascinating. None of them spoke, spoke English, but boy, did they laugh and smile a lot. Uh, not a whole lot of younger kids except for the ones uh, I think that represented the, the village itself, the French people. And tell me about the village, that, where it was held. Uh, it was in this big uh, square, you know, like the town square mm -hmm. you hear about in books. Uh, there's an actual town square and there's cobblestone streets and big churches made out of, you know, one foot, you know, uh, bricks. Um, it's, it's just like an old village that you would see and all the town folk were very, very beautiful and friendly and supportive and during those parades you had some of these people that were almost like groupies they kept on showing up just to see your group really um, yeah it was beautiful and, and to try and explain to people you know the words Native American or American Indian they're, they're not familiar with those things or indigenous all Did the they know where you were from I mean no they know you're from the United no, States no, no because the books yeah. and, and the, the images and the movies they had seen were only the ones from the Wild West shows or the movies <laughs> Um, so when we show up in uh, regalia that we represent ourselves with today, um, they weren't too familiar. So they'd have to read the sign that one of the French village uh, youth would be carrying that said where we're from. They would say, oh, you... Kind of like the Olympics, huh, when they yeah, had the flags. Yeah, exactly. So each group had somebody representing us with the sign. And our sign said, Amerindian. <laughs> Amerindian. We're like, well, what is Amerindian? And that's what they're used to calling us, mainly from Canada, I understand. When I first went out to France and I wanted to explain that I'm American Indian because they wanted, you know, in Paris everybody had said, oh, they don't like Americans. And, okay, well, I'm not going to buy into that until I'm there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they said, well, where are you from? In French. And I'd say, well, I'm American, but I'm a, the original American. So, it was, uh, you know, je suis American d'origine. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I said that, they're like, oh, 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 that's different. You're not American. You're the original American. And so that was in interesting to learn about the different ways that language plays a role in how we understand each other. I mean, even in English amongst ourselves and politics and, you know, academia, uh, the language itself has so much power in how we use it. Um, so uh, out there, uh, they knew that we we're American Indian because it said American Indian on the sign. <laughs> ah, interesting. So you did parade, you did, um, so all the entertainment was right there in the town square. That was your stage? Uh, there was a stage, there was a little outlying stage. Uh, some of the groups would do things in pubs and we'd refuse to do that just because we had our feathers with us. We said, well, I know that you booked us for that, but we can't mm. do it. We're, we just, we're just can't. It's not that we just refuse, it's just we can't bring our feathers into a pub and do a, mm -hmm. a performance. Mm -hmm. so, and, and they were totally respectful about that. But we did go to the museum, the, the one about the feather exhibit over in Vichy, which is about 30, 20 miles outside of uh, Ganao, which is more of a, like a town. Uh, like a city, like a small city. Uh, we did go to the volcano place, uh, but everything else was there in the town on, the, on that stage. Yeah. So, what was the feather museum? It was a mu It wasn't. It was a museum that had an, a special exhibit about feathers, and so they had these different uh, hair ornaments from Japan that used feathers that had been imported back, you know, 800 years ago, and you know, all these very, very beautiful things. Things from uh, you know uh, Mesoamerica, from you know Mexico, Central America, mm -hmm. that had you know very ornate headdresses and things like that of feathers. So their exhibit was to show and I guess illustrate the use of feathers and the importance of feathers and the interpretation of feathers for different cultures. There, it was all in French, so I couldn't read it. Um, but we came to represent, in some aspect, American Indian people, uh, you know, the United States, um, and our understanding of feathers. So we got to explain to them how we use feathers, what they mean to us, and you know, the value of or the use of religiously and things like that. So. Now you performed a hoop dance there? Yes. What did, is, so I, what I did, did hoop dance quite often and I would explain you know, the hoop dance and the different origin stories and its uses according to the people that have taught me. Um, but yeah, we did fancy dance, hoop dance, fancy shawl, northern traditional, uh, you know, all these different uh, dances. We, you know, we would sing a solo song just to kind of get the audience to be familiar with the music and you know, the understanding. And 
backstage, I guess you can say it was backstage, but really kind of like these open tents where we, were, where we all were, there's opportunities for us to share our dance with another dancer. So we would, you know, kind of my dance with some of the uh, Argentine traditional dances, not Argentine tango, they did that too, but some traditional Argentine dances. And we'd look at their footwork and we would do footwork and we would oh, really? sit there and look at each other and do it together. So that was really fun. Um, you know, with the Russian group and, you know, some of the, the jumps and the high jumps and the low squatting, low movement kind of stuff, we would sit there and do that with them. And, and we would, it was just a beautiful Did they experience. do that thing where they go down real low and they walk? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh the, the sliding, this and all that. We were sitting there going, wow, hey, the did origins you, did of hip-hop. Did you try it? No, <laughs> of course, but not in my breech cloth. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, yeah. We tried all those things, and it, it was just it was it was wonderful. I gave hoops to people and said, "Okay, you, you're going to fit through this hoop." Thank God, nobody broke my hoops. <laughs> but um, you know, we got the Russian people, the Argentine people, uh, lots of different. Explain people. to our audience what the hoop dance is. So hoop dance um, is going to have different stories depending on where you hear them from and from you know regional tribes. Uh, it's a dance where you have a hoop about the size of your arms and a little bigger, a little smaller, depending and you pick the hoop up off the ground and it tells a story of creation. Most people would agree that it tells a story of creation where you pick up a hoop and you maneuver your body through the hoop and you take another hoop and you maneuver your body through the two and as you're doing the one, two, three, four, five hoops, you're making different designs that illustrate animals, insects, plant life and if you can do it the right way, if it's done the right way, if you're taught the right way, uh, I believe, you can really tell the story of creation, how all things come from a single circle, and it's beautiful to take a look at that and then look into science and say, well, it's kind of the same story of your mitosis theory. And Were you able to tell the story without any narration? Well, I think of a dancer's really good. They're supposed to. Because I'm so. thinking if they don't all understand the language. Right, so there is the two hosts, that, uh, like the MCs of the uh -huh. event on stage that would give a description of what the, uh, you know, what the audience was going to see so the audience had a little bit of a preface mm -hmm. to you know, what was going to happen so that they're not just exposed to something brand new completely. Um, what are these Indian people with all these feathers and bells you know, spinning around? I, I thought they rode horses. Um, so we gave you know, a little short narrative to the, to the MCs and they would be able to relate to the audience what they were going to see. So we gave them different origin stories, the ones that I've been told, um, and the different uses of hoop dance and interpretations thereof. How how they receive it? Was it something they, were, they probably hadn't seen before? I would imagine none of them had seen it before, and there was just so many people afterwards that wanted to know so much more about it, and they wanted to feel them and see them. And is this really traditional? I mean, I get the same thing here in the United States when you do hoop dance or a lot of the different dances. Is this really traditional? Is this really what Indian people do? Thought it was just horses and teepees. Uh, so yeah, the, the audience was just, again, it felt like we would have groupies from time to time. You know, people looking at, you know, Sarah and Anacita going, wow, Indian women are very, very beautiful. And we're like, we know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the guys are all right, but they, they dance pretty good. And so we, we, had a, we had a blast. We really, really did. And uh, the, the people there, what's interesting, that I, another thing that I learned is when a group of people are believed to be a certain way, a, a type of prejudice, if you will, so when people hear of American Indians, we're all the same, we all believe the same thing, we do the same thing, we're angry about the same thing, we want the same thing, and it's not really true. In France, when people say, well, the French people, they're like this, they're like this, and you know, they don't like Americans. When you're in a town, not Paris, but when you're in a town far, far removed from the city life, they say, we're French, they're Parisians. And I thought about it, how we tend to get caught up into this, this, this play of, of thinking that a whole group of people are represented by a small group. And I think that's really, really important to understand that all countries, traditional people and modernity or politics or religion or money or business, they're two different things. And I think that's one of the things that we understand about ourselves because we're living in it, but we need to see that that's happening in a lot of other countries as well in retaining the traditions of their people, their indigenous people. It's happening everywhere. Huh, that's interesting. And when you think about it, it's a, what we see on TV too, our perception of those countries and those people. Right. Because, well, some of us don't get to travel everywhere <laughs> around the world, but you know, we do. We l rely on what we've seen in the movies or you know, right. the background scenes, and we don't get the firsthand one-on-one -on -one, you know, experience from people who live it. Sure. Trying to you know, 
allow yourself to be introduced to and then navigate within a culture is it's intimidating, so most people don't do it, and therefore we rely on these prejudices, which is the same that we feel other people you know, experience with us. It's, we have open you know, opportunities such as powwows. It's just a first time thing. Just go to a powwow first. You know, go there and see who we really are, and not just what you read or what you see that sells, because a lot of the imagery that we get of other countries or other people, a lot of the imagery that other people, even within the country, get of us, is whatever sells. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily the That's authenticity true. of you know our essence, our traditions, what we believe in, what we fight for, what we die for. Wow, thank you for sharing your experience on your trip because I found it really fascinating and I haven't been over there. So, But just for, we have a few couple minutes left okay. and we were really short on the introduction. I want you to tell the audience of your many talents because you do so much. You're a teacher, you're, you, you're a dancer, you're, you, Designer, tell us a little bit about you, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> See, put you on the spot. Huh? <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to have to drink this water for two minutes. Um, so I've been blessed with being able to dance uh, since, you know, for the past 35, 40 years. Um, so being able to go into schools for elementary kids, going into universities, uh, going to prisons and, and, and such to, to share that beauty. Um, I've been teaching at... Uh, San Francisco State University and College of Marin in American Indian Studies. Uh, I've been working with the, the fashion line called Indigenous Couture where we are making a line of clothes that aren't necessarily to try and sell but really to try and tell a story, uh, give a narrative of you know traditional American Indian clothing which is couture. It's all one of a kind. They tell stories. So and you promised to do a fashion show. Have a fashion we'll, we'll show promise to us. do a fashion show here. You said uh, spring but we'll try and push it fall. <laughs> Um, but you have so many talents, and we, we're going to come share the rest of them with the audience soon. All right. I but promise. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having and me. And sharing your story. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week on Native Voice TV. Good night.